Impossible games have a pretty good track record. The Impossible Quiz, that Winnie the Pooh baseball game, Mission Impossible, Impossible Mission, but not every game has to be that hard. Maybe you'd like to tone it down a little. For that, we need to talk about difficulty options. Difficulty options have been around since the Atari days. Games have always had to strike a balance between being challenging enough to be fun, but not too hard to be overwhelming. As with most things that have been around this long, game designers over the years have come up with a lot of ideas for how to tinker with difficulty in a game. Some great, others really, really bad. Difficulty can mean so many things, and will look a little different in almost every type of game. Let's walk down the paths that other games have used to deal with difficulty and see some exotic options that are out there to help games feel just right for the biggest audience possible. Turn down the difficulty of learning math and science with today's sponsor, Brilliant.org. You like to listen to us break down game design ideas and see how and why they work at a fundamental level. Brilliant does the same thing for math, science, engineering, and data analysis. Brilliant has thousands of lessons to choose from, everything from basic math to data science and programming, and their interactive lessons, not just lectures. Just about every game designer would be smart to brush up on their probability and statistics fundamentals. This course on Brilliant is expertly crafted to show you what all the ideas are actually about and guide you through interactive lessons to make sure those ideas stick. The world of statistics will reveal itself to you. Very useful. Brilliant posts new lessons monthly, so there's always something fresh to learn. Try it out for free for 30 days at brilliant.org slash design doc, or click the link in the description. The first 200 to sign up will get 20% off of Brilliant's annual premium subscription. Thanks, Brilliant. So why are there difficulty options anyway? Wouldn't it just be easier to design a game once in one way and leave it at that? Sure, it would be, but your audience is going to suffer if you stick to that too hard. Games have a Goldilocks problem. For most people, most of the time, games are only fun if their difficulty lands in a sweet spot. Not too easy, and not too hard. Go too easy, and the game can feel patronizing. God of War Ragnarok is notorious for having your partner character blurt out hints, or even the whole solution, almost as soon as you get to a puzzle. The idea was to keep some players from dropping out of the game entirely if they got to a puzzle they couldn't solve themselves. It's a nice thought. There's nothing worse than a brick wall of a puzzle you can't seem to make any headway on. But the devs didn't receive any complaints from the testers about puzzle spoilers. They never added an option to stop or delay how long it took for your companion to spoil the answer, so you get the hint whenever the game decides you need one, which is almost immediately. In trying to get as many people as possible through the puzzles, they annoyed the larger pool of players that wanted to solve it themselves. After all, if a game is going to tell you the solution right away, why bother having the puzzle there to begin with? Games that are too hard can be bad too. Bubsy is notorious for its cheap, unforgiving difficulty. Bubsy has the constitution of a wet paper bag and will kill over if he gets brushed by a gumball. The game is a Sonic-inspired platformer, with a good amount of speed, but that creates situations where you're jumping around almost blind. Imagine Sonic with one-hit kills. Land wrong, and you're done. It's not too bad if you memorize the level, but come on. Who's going to memorize Bubsy? Cheap, unforeseeable progress loss is among the most annoying things a game can do, and Bubsy's full of it. But what does too easy or too hard even mean? Well, that's the trickiest part of the problem. It's different for different people. A 5-year-old playing her first Mario game doesn't have the skill, coordination, experience, or expectations her 35-year-old father might have. Two brothers that run a YouTube channel about video games might have one that can finish Super Metroid like a normal person, and one that can't platform in it to save his life. Hey. Oh, you hate the truth now? The same difficulty would be hard-pressed to keep the game fun for everyone. Not only that, but the sweet spot of difficulty is even different for the same person at different times. The first time you opened up Devil May Cry, you were way worse at the game than you might be now. If you played Street Fighter 4 on release, you might be a lot worse these days at it. The sweet spot is a constantly moving target, and difficulty options help you spread out your shots to make it easier to hit where you need to hit. One size literally cannot fit all. There's another insidious factor at play that makes setting game difficulty tricky. Developers are notorious for being terrible judges of how hard their own games are. It's not their fault though. It's a natural and maybe inescapable part of game development. Solo indie devs especially run into this problem all the time. They're playing, testing, 
thinking, and designing the tricks in the game they're making. They literally know everything there is to know about it. By the time the game is finished, they've played it hundreds or thousands of times. At that point, what feels tricky and fun to the dev will feel impossibly difficult to someone coming into the game fresh. Those difficulty blinders are one of the reasons live playtesting is so valuable. Mark Brown found out exactly this while making his Magnet game, and shared the experience in his most recent GMTK video, whose thumbnail gave me a mini heart attack when it popped up this week. I thought he made roughly the same video for a second. Dodge the bullet there. So, if you're ready to design some difficulty levels into your game, where do you start? Well, you could start with the basics, game quantities. These are tweaks to a lot of the numbers and options that you're probably already familiar with. Halo comes with four official difficulty options. Easy, Normal, Heroic, and the Legendary, Legendary. Each option changes a host of variables that influence basic game mechanics, like shield strength, health, and weapon damage. Higher difficulties boost both enemy attributes and nerf your own, as you'd expect. You might have half the shields and health while each enemy has twice as much as on Normal. The mix of units you encounter in any given fight can change with flood enemies getting equipped with weapons more often, or boosting how many stealth elites you have to take care of to get through a section. Instead of fighting two of them in normal, Legendary might give you four to six of them in the same place. Enemy AI dramatically changes as well. On Legendary, everyone becomes much more accurate and fires faster than normal. Tactics can even change, where enemies might group up more often rather than go it alone. Halo's suite of health, damage, and behavioral tweaks are greatest hits of the tried and true difficulty modifier options that many games use, and most people likely first think about when they think of what changing a game's difficulty means. Of course, just tweaking sliders isn't a fix-all. If that's all you do to change difficulty levels, it's not hard to wind up with a more difficult, but less fun game. Metroid is one of my favorite series, but its approach to a hard mode rarely ever feels right to me. Let's use Metroid Dread as an example. On normal, the game is already challenging, but fair. Enemies deal a lot of damage. Attacks can be tricky to deal with and require all your abilities like 360 aiming, parrying, and dashing to precisely dodge and counterattack. The enemies and bosses are pattern-based, and while difficult, it feels very possible to get through the fights without taking damage if you know what you're doing. Maybe you'll struggle in your first playthrough, but you'll figure it out if you stick with it. The game's hard mode doesn't really ramp up the challenge. Instead of changing enemy placement, behaviors, or adjusting things like parry timing to make things more challenging, the game really just makes enemies hit harder. Navigation and exploration stays the same. The cat and mouse stealth segments with the Emmy robots are completely unchanged. It's the same game, just with a little less room for error. The early game on hard forces you to be extra cautious and punishes minor mistakes more, but the bosses aren't really any different if you had already learned to avoid damage. The game's highest difficulty, Dread, boils that down even more to just a no-hit run. For new players, this type of hard mode makes the learning process more frustrating if they jump straight into it. For experienced players, the game barely changes when you crank it up to hard. So who is having more fun on hard mode? Maybe someone, I guess. It's not my cup of tea, though. The fan community has filled in the gap with self-imposed challenge runs, with sequence breaking, low item runs, or restricting the use of abilities to make the game feel different. Striking a balance between too easy and too hard is really tough to nail. Any sequence you make in a game might be off, a bit too hard in a couple places, or maybe a little too easy. What if we could feather it just a little, make the difficulty level adapt? Survival horror games are often deeply tied to resource management and efficiency. The stuff you have on hand to defend yourself is finite, so you have to use it wisely to survive. You could put yourself in unwinnable situations if you were a little too trigger happy. But most Resident Evil games keep that in mind and have an escape valve. Each game in the series does it a little differently, but the games have an adaptive difficulty system to smooth things over. It keeps track of the player's performance through their inventory and how much damage they've taken, and fine-tunes some things accordingly. It influences things like item drops, enemy strength, health, or even their behavior. Enemies might move slower, or perform evasive actions at a different rate. If you're taking a lot of hits and are very low on healing items, the game might give you some more green herbs. If you die and hit continue, enemies might be weaker, less aggressive, or fewer in numbers. 
If you go a while without taking hits, or if you start taking out a bunch of enemies, the game can ramp things back up to make it more challenging. The changes are subtle and gradual, which stops the game from feeling like it's patronizing the player. It's a seamless thing that tries to keep players from feeling like they hit a wall, but also not undercutting the game's challenge level for those who are ready for it. And if the player is really ready, the professional difficulty maxes out how hard the game gets and disables the system from dropping you any lower. You chose it. You live with it. What else can we tinker with to make a game harder? Hit points and damage feel too surface level, too much like adjusting a slider. What if I wanted my difficulty levels to change game qualities, the things that are fundamental to what the game is? It's a little easier to tinker with some of these fundamentals in a rhythm game, but good on Beat Saber for letting you really dig in. On one level, Beat Saber gives you what you'd expect, a handful of note charts, er, box charts per song, spread over five difficulty levels, from easy to expert plus. Beat Saber's got layers though, you get control over some of the other variables that give the song its character. You can turn off failure. You can remove the bombs or the flying walls that you have to avoid. If you're having trouble with a routine, hit the 30% slower option and treat it more like a practice session. If it's too easy, try making the arrows that tell you how to cut the boxes disappear before they reach you. Speed up the song by a bit. Or add ghost notes. I'm not even gonna tell you what that one is. It's too scary. There are plenty of little tweaks to add and remove to make the song you're playing a little easier or even a lot harder. It's not just for pride either. Many of the options change the score multiplier up or down, which affects how many points you can get on any song. A perfect routine might not get you on top of the leaderboard. You might have to do it sped up with ghost notes. With Beat Saber, there's always a little more challenge you can squeeze out of the system, which helps increase the longevity of the game. If you're allergic to nuance and think subtlety is for cowards, you could use difficulty levels to take a hacksaw to your game's structure. The licensed SNES game Tiny Toon Adventures, Buster Bus Loose, deletes chunks of itself in its easiest mode. If you set it to children difficulty, you gain an invincible dash ability, and major parts that the devs thought would be hard for kids are skipped. Sequences with instant death traps get removed. The boss fight is taken out of stage one. There's an auto-scroller sequence that never appears in stage two. The boss fight is taken out of stage 3. All of stage 5 is gone, so you go from stage 4 to 6 directly. The final boss, wouldn't you know, is completely missing. I guess it does make the game easier to beat if you just remove half of it. It's not an unworkable idea, but cutting out big chunks of a game is a little sloppy. The point of having easier difficulties is to let more players experience a game. Everyone seeks out different things from the games they play. And not everyone will be looking for, in the mood for, or even ready for a game presenting an especially tough challenge. But if you're going to offer an easy option to begin with, don't punish players for taking it. Cuphead has two difficulty levels to select for every boss. Simple and Regular. Simple mode removes phases from bosses and simplifies patterns, but it also bars you from reaching the game's finale. Even if you finish everything on normal, say for one or two fights that were giving you trouble, tough luck. You're supposed to only play the game on normal, I guess. The contradiction between giving the option to tone it down before every boss only to punish you afterward for doing so seems unnecessary. Cuphead is tuned with its normal difficulty in mind. For most people, overcoming the challenge is part of the experience. When it works, it's very satisfying. An easy mode can undercut that satisfaction, but not everyone playing was looking for that experience anyway. Cuphead even offers other ways to make fights easier. Different power-ups can sometimes trivialize some challenges, especially after the DLC was released. But its simple mode is the only fight easification option that arbitrarily stops players from experiencing the whole game. If you don't want to provide a traditional easy mode, that's fine too. But if you do, don't lock players out of major content like the game's finale for using the feature you put in there in the first place. Difficulty doesn't just have to be about what the game is, though. It could be about what the game asks you to do. GoldenEye makes great use of an objective list to tweak how the game feels to play as it gets harder. The three difficulty modes, Agent, Secret Agent, and Double O Agent, give the standard suite of health and AI behavior changes you might expect. On Agent, guards are inaccurate and crumble quickly. Body armor and ammo pickups are all over, plus you only have to check off a very short list of objectives on the level. On Dam, just jump off the dam. Easy. Secret Agent turns up the heat with more accurate guards and fewer pickups, 
and makes you take out all the level's alarms before jumping. Double O Agent cranks enemy behavior up further, makes you do all the previous objectives, plant a modem, and stop by the computer room to steal some data. And if you're still looking for a challenge, 007 mode lets you tailor your own experience, where you can set guard health, accuracy, and perceptiveness to levels way past even what you'd find on 00 Agent. The changing objectives force you to scour the level and make a run in 00 Agent feel qualitatively different, especially if you had been playing each difficulty in ascending order. Without spending a lot of time generating new level content, new objectives can add plenty of challenge and real replayability to a game. Platformers can have a hard time creating a lot of difficulty levels that make sense. Challenges can make that job a little easier. To add more variety, lots of modern platformers will have optional challenges and extra stages that stand as the thing that steps it up. Think of the B-side and C-side levels in Celeste, the Dark Worlds in Super Meat Boy, the post-game of Mario Odyssey, or one of my favorites, the Death Wish DLC in A Hat in Time. These are a collection of isolated challenges that take the game's existing stages and bosses and ramps them all up with new level designs, more extreme attack patterns, harsher objectives, or special stipulations that make you rethink how to win. A stage that took place in lava will now damage you over time if you don't cool off with buckets of water. Another time-limited stage on a train may cut that timer way, way down. Maybe a level keeps track of an extra objective, like not getting hit or not jumping too much. This one makes you complete a boss rush while equipping the one-hit kill badge. The challenges are there to force you to explore the limits of the game's mechanics and find alternate strategies to get to the end. You get rewarded with cool cosmetics, but really the reward is the satisfaction of a job well done. If you wanted that party hat but it's just too hard to get, the game mercifully adds a peace and tranquility accessibility option where you enter the no judgment zone, pay a little money, trance out for a bit, and the game cranks down the challenge. There you go, a frustration-free hat, if that's what you wanted. A Hat in Time provides a good balance of providing a stiff optional challenge that extends the game with tangible rewards, but without getting too hung up on excluding anyone. Instead of a dedicated hard mode or highly difficult challenges, you could just provide a very high skill ceiling for players to shoot for. You see this a lot in character action games with ranking systems, but a handful of platformers can do it too. Like Pizza Tower. It's not that hard to finish a stage in Pizza Tower. The game takes Wario Land inspiration in that you can't really die, but mastering the game is a whole other story. Pizza Tower's stage structure is inspired by the later Wario Land titles, where you venture through levels collecting items, finding secret areas with powers, and taking out chains of enemies for points until you reach your objective. Then, it's pizza time, where you have to sprint back to the start before time expires. If you run out of time, the villain probably gets you and you restart the whole stage. If you do well, you might get, like a B rank, not bad, but not great. To get that elusive S rank, you need to constantly build and maintain your combo count by taking out enemies, collecting ingredients and items, and not getting hit. You have to study the stage and execute at a high level. Ah, S rank. Congrats. But is this the best you can do? Some say there's a mystical P rank, where, in a single run, you have to maintain a perfect combo, get every major collectible, including a secret treasure, find three hidden areas, and transcend the need to exit properly. Instead, enter a portal and do a second lap within the same time limit. You're almost guaranteed to run out of time and get chased down, which adds to the pressure, all while the music goes hard in the background. To get that P rank, you're not just beating the stage, you're styling all over it. The stages are all intricately designed to make that high skill run possible while pushing players to their limits. Pizza Tower never needs to explicitly tell you you're playing at the hardest, highest difficulty. It just makes one available to those with the courage to seek it out. So we've got lots of options for creating cool difficulty levels. But there's another catch. A lot of players don't really mess around much with that setting. They set it once and just go. If you've crafted a unique experience that only happens in one of the modes, it can be very hard to signal to a player that changing the difficulty from their comfort zone is worth doing. Often, word of mouth will spread about what the best difficulty is for a game, but not everyone is gonna know about that. How can you encourage someone to explore the different difficulties you've created? This one's going to come down to building the right incentives. Bug Fables is a spiritual successor to Paper Mario and iterates on a lot of the core combat ideas to create a deeper combat system. 
the tools you have revolve around the game's metal system that you can equip to give yourself extra bonuses and perks as you progress. It sort of resembles a deck builder with all the viable strategies you can discover with the metals you find. If you tack on a hard mode metal, it creates a stiffer challenge in every encounter and gives you better rewards. The best of them show up when you defeat bosses with the hard mode metal equipped. You get new metals that expand the game's combat system even further, letting you create all kinds of exotic new builds to try. Successful tinkering with your build lets you tinker even more, which is exactly the kind of thing that appeals to the players looking to wring everything they can out of the game's combat. It's a good system, but some games can go even further. As a roguelite, Hades is quite challenging straight out of the gate by design. Very few players will be able to get through a run within their first few tries. It's meant to be chipped away at. It's a tough game whose difficulty slowly erodes as you get both subjectively stronger as you gain playing experience, and objectively stronger as you unlock permanent upgrades. Bit by bit, the game gets easier and easier until you can finally get that clearing run. But that's the structure of lots of roguelikes. That's not that special. So once you finish a run, that's it, right? Nope. That's just your first clear. There's way more to come. Hades is chock full of more storylines, unlockable weapons, new upgrades, and most importantly, the Pact of Punishment. One of the ways to get more upgrade materials is to do incrementally more challenging runs via the Pact, a list of difficulty modifiers that grant 1-4 to four points of heat each. The more clears you get with a specific weapon type, the higher the heat requirement gets. There's a wide variety of modifiers like making enemies stronger and faster, adding a time limit for each region, making traps and lava hurt you four times as much, giving armored enemies an extra buff, forcing players to sacrifice one of their boons in each region, limiting your upgrade options, taking away permanent passive buffs, or even extreme measures, which completely changes the game's four main boss encounters to something new. You don't have to push the system to its extremes to get the upgrades you want. You'll be able to get through a ton of runs with pretty low heat levels and easy modifiers. But if you're feeling it, you can crank it way up and give a personalized ultimate challenge that shows off the combat system's depth and forces you to strategize carefully to succeed. The Pact of Punishment is a brilliant way to extend the life of Hades through tweaking its difficulty in ways that only seasoned players might appreciate acting as a reward, a challenge, inspiration, and a life extender. It encourages you to branch out of what you think your comfort zone is to really explore the depth the game has to offer, all while giving such a fine-grained difficulty tuning mechanism that the game stays at exactly your personal sweet spot for way longer than you might expect. Letting players gain better rewards for taking on greater risk is a classic way to encourage them to step out of their comfort zone. It's great, if it works. It doesn't always work. This type of system has to support the player's sense of control over their situation. In the early 2010s, Sakurai and his team added an intensity slider to Kid Icarus Uprising and Smash 4. Kid Icarus lets you, for a price, set the intensity of a stage on a scale of 0 to 9. Higher numbers would up the difficulty, adding more and stronger enemies and rewarding you with extra money and weapon drops if you could persevere. If you can't though, not only do you lose out on some of those rewards, but the intensity level decreases automatically. The game also had intensity gates that were open only if you played above that number. The gates held bonus fights with slightly tougher enemy encounters that paid you in extra weapons for completing them. If you lost either before or during one of these gate encounters, the lowered intensity could lock you out of retrying these altogether. Normally, automatically reducing the difficulty level for a player who is repeatedly dying can feel patronizing. But in Kid Icarus, this system created a strong risk-reward element that really upped the tension for some of the harder fights in the game. The same idea was brought over to Smash Wii U and 3DS's classic modes, though they had to contend with some new problems. The broad risk-reward elements of the system are the same, but the way Smash increased its challenge is less great. Not only would you have to fight stronger and smarter CPU enemies based on the intensity, but the game often forced you into group battles with up to 8 opponents at once. Random stages, random items, and random objectives. The sheer chaos of those fights might be fun in isolation, but when you have so much on the line, the luck-based elements undercut the system, making it feel more cheap than challenging. If you lost, your intensity level would drop, and the final boss might not even go through all of its unique phases. 
Losing out on some rewards is fair enough, but getting locked out of a final boss phase just because some random bot got some free kills on you with the game's ridiculously overpowered items is more frustrating than fun. It always feels better if the player is in control of how risky the risk is. Dynamic difficulty systems work best when the change in difficulty is based on your performance rather than how lucky you get on any run. Well, I've increased the longevity of this video enough for one day. Head to the comments and let's talk about your crowning achievements in some tough games, and what you had to go through to get it done. I wonder if anyone's gonna notice that we didn't talk about Dark Souls at all in a video about difficulty options. Probably not. I'm also happy to announce that we've added some new content over at our Patreon, so head over there to get access to early release main channel videos, our behind the scenes podcast, topic polls, the new newsletter, and other perks. Difficulty options can be so much more than tweaking numbers. They can demand more from players and alter the fabric of a game. A great difficulty option system accommodates all kinds of player skills, wants, and needs, and is the secret that helps the most people have the best time.